Remarkably, there was a time when chemistry looked like this. Instead of regular chemical formulas and rational tables, an entire web of beautiful symbolic mythological images was projected on top of what the alchemists saw in their crucibles. All with the goal of finding a red substance with the power to create gold. Which the Greeks called holithos ton philosophon, the Muslims hajar al falasifa, and the Latins lapis philosophorum, which all translates to the philosopher's stone. In 3rd century Egypt, a number of Greek alchemists made the creation of gold their highest goal. And centuries later, the substance to effectuate this transmutation was called the Philosopher's Stone. Many in history claimed to have made the stone, but they wrote their recipes down deliberately cryptically, supposedly to prevent the secret from falling into the wrong hands while actually to hide the fact that none of them managed to produce the stone. When alchemy finally moved to the West, the use of this metaphorical language multiplied tremendously. And from the 15th century, many stunning picture books emerged, each claiming to hide the secret of the stone. In the 16th century, the great Paracelsus applied alchemy to medicine. And he even claimed to be able to create living beings called homunculi in his crucible. And alchemists such as Nicholas Flamel were rumored to have found an elixir to live forever. And shockingly, Isaac Newton took their texts very seriously, writing about a million words on alchemy during his career. In the 17th century, a relatively standardized recipe for the stone appeared culminating in the creation of the white stone for silver and the red stone for gold. So, we have a lot to get to. Let's start. Hey, good to see you. This is Stefan, author of In Search of the Sublime. On this World History Channel, we'll trace humanity's relentless pursuit of scientific truth, moral excellence and enlightenment. You'll meet anyone from Mesopotamian astronomers and Indian yogis to Greek philosophers and Enlightenment scientists. And you'll meet them firsthand using primary sources, giving you valuable insights that transcend the surface level understanding you get on other channels. So go check it out for yourself. Let's start. The first alchemical texts arrived in Europe in the 12th century. And a century later, Western alchemists began to write works of their own. An important early work was written under the pseudonym Geber, which was actually a Latinized version of the Muslim alchemist Jabir ibn Hayyan. Here we see one of these texts, this one reading Geber, the greatest philosopher and alchemist. Besides some nonsensical claims about the stone, Geber did give an interesting account of the differences between metals. He claimed that gold compared to other metals was made of smaller parts that were tightly packed together. And this allowed him to explain why gold is heavier than other metals. Quite a reasonable idea. And he claimed it also explains why gold isn't corrosive, as flames can penetrate that tightly packed lattice of particles. And although these ideas are finally false, it is an early example of scientific reasoning. The earliest Western texts on alchemy were written in a relatively straightforward language, but has changed in the 14th century, when the metaphors became even more complicated than before. The flight of a dove might symbolize evaporation, as did the departure of a soul from the body. A potent reaction between two chemicals might be described as a marriage between a king and a queen. Or a reaction might be described by a king eating his own son. Very curious. Or a green lion devouring the sun might represent gold being dissolved in mercury or aqua regia. And in all these cases, the reader was left guessing which substances these metaphors refer to. Pseudo Arnold of Villanova, also from the 14th century, became the first to use Christian metaphors to describe chemical processes. 
For instance, he compared the torments of Christ on the cross with the torments of materials in his crucible. And similarly, he compared the resurrection of Christ with the transmutation of mercury into the philosopher's stone. And he compared Christ's role as savior of mankind with the saving of base metals by turning them into gold. And Petrus Bonus, also from the 14th century, even went as far as to claim that alchemical processes could reveal theological truths. For instance, he believed that ancient philosophers had predicted the virgin birth in their crucible, so they didn't even need the Bible to learn about the virgin birth. And in a similar vein, he wrote, I firmly believe that should any unbeliever truly know this divine art that is alchemy, it would be of necessity make him a believer in the Trinity of God, and he would believe in Jesus Christ our Lord, the Son of God. A very curious mix between alchemy and religion. The famous alchemy books filled with images only appeared in the 15th and 16th centuries, with one of the earliest being the Rosarium Philosophorum, or the Rose Garden of the Philosophers which is a fascinating work of art. The 14th century original contained no images, but then in 1550 AD, it was combined with images which were inspired by two early 15th century German works called Sun and Moon and the Book of the Holy Trinity. According to the text, the Philosopher's Stone could be created by combining two substances, which they refer to as sun and moon, king and queen, or sulfur and mercury. These opposites were combined to form the stone, and the product of this combination would first die, and this is why we see the substance here in a tomb. And finally, it would form a hermaphrodite, which mythologically speaking was a child of Hermes and Aphrodite, and came to have both male and female characteristics symbolizing this union of opposites. This hermaphrodite was also called the rebis, from res bina, meaning double matter, again showing this union of opposites. Mysteriously, the text then added that the gold that could be made from this stone was, quote, not the common gold, but instead a more mysterious philosophical alternative. Ironically, over time, a relatively stable recipe crystallized in the alchemical text of the 17th century for the creation of the stone. And let's now go through the steps. At first, a number of substances, about which the text disagreed by the way, were placed in a glass vessel with an oval body and a long neck. This flask was called the philosophical egg or ovum philosophicum referring both to its shape and also to its function of giving birth to the stone. The opening in the neck was then melted shut to prevent the loss of gases, and this came to be known as the hermetic seal, referring to Hermes, the Greek equivalent of the Roman god Mercury, which is also that liquid metal that was so important to the alchemists. The egg was then placed in a furnace for many weeks, until the substance turned black, and it was believed that this meant that the substance had decomposed to prime matter, the most basic form of matter, and this stage was generally referred to as putrefaction or rotting, or nigredo or blackness, and the furnace in this stage was often compared to a tomb or a coffin. Common images associated with this stage are the crow, or the death of a king, or the god Mercury in the form of a dragon, with the dragon serpent creature again referring to base matter, the most unadorned form of matter. Over time the blackness disappeared and made way to a number of changing colors known as the peacock's tail, and then a white stone appeared which was said to be able to transmute base metals into silver, and this phase was often called albedo or whiteness. 
By turning up the heat, the white eventually turned yellow and then a red stone formed. A stage known as rubedo or redness. And this stone was the legendary Philosopher's Stone that could turn base metals into gold. And at this stage, Mercury was often depicted in human form, turning from a dragon at its most earthy stage to a human. Authorities, by the way, had a love-hate relationship with alchemy. On the one hand, the idea of endless gold was appealing, actually causing several kings to employ alchemists in their courts. But alchemists also created huge amounts of imitation gold, which caused high inflation at times, leading to economic collapse. And as a result, Pope John XXII even felt compelled to issue a decree banning alchemical gold. He wrote, The impoverished alchemists promise riches that they do not deliver, and those who think themselves wise fall into the ditch they have dug. For indeed, the professors of this art of alchemy make fools of one another. Finally, though there is no such thing in nature, they pretend to make gold and silver by a false transmutation. The decree, however, was largely ignored, surprisingly even in holy orders. The promise of limitless gold also made various alchemists targets of criminals, at least according to their own stories. We have various anecdotes of bandits forcing alchemists to reveal their secrets. And in the Rosarium Philosophorum we read, not a few have perished in our work. And the 17th century George Starkey, an American who came to England writing under the pseudonym Irenaeus Philaletes, told the following story. It was only a short time ago that after visiting the plague-stricken hounds of a certain city and restoring the sick to perfect health by means of miraculous medicine, I found myself surrounded by a yelling mob who demanded that I should give them my elixir of the sages. And it was only by changing my dress and my name, by shaving off my beard and putting on a wig, that I was able to save my life and escape from the hands of those wicked men. I know of several persons who were found strangled in their beds, simply because they were suspected of possessing this secret though in reality they knew no more about it than their murderers. And remarkably, great scientists, including Newton and Boyle, read his work. The connection between alchemy and medicine was made explicit by the influential alchemical doctor Theophratus from Hohenheim from the 16th century, who was better known as Paracelsus. Paracelsus had little interest in created gold and instead saw the potential of alchemy to cure diseases. He also developed what he called a chemical worldview, very interesting, in which he envisioned God as a master chemist. For instance, he said that the cycle of rain through the sea, air and land was nothing more than God's cosmic distillation. And in fact, in my chemistry class, I still describe this process as distillation. And he rightly concluded that the formation of minerals underground, the growth of life, and also internal processes such as digestion, all point to complex chemical processes. And finally, a religious touch, he added that God's final judgment by fire was also similar to an alchemist using fire to purify metals. Paracelsus also claimed that chemistry could be used to create life. This had also been an obsession of Jabir ibn Ayyan, the great Islamic alchemist, who wrote several recipes for creating scorpions, snakes, and even human beings who would become subject to their creator. Paracelsus claimed that he could make a human-like creature, which he called a humunculus or a little human, by petrifying semen and then feeding it with blood. And although the product looked like a human child, he claimed that it was endowed with great knowledge and powers, partly, he claimed, because it lacked female ingredients. A very curious description. And in contrast, he writes, using menstrual blood resulted in the creation of a basilisk, the serpent that could kill with a single glance. 
We read, Let the semen of a man putrefy by itself in a sealed alembic, with the highest putrefaction of the horse dung for forty days, or until it begins at last to live, move, and be agitated, which can easily be seen. And after this time, it will in some degree look like a human being, but nevertheless transparent and without a body. If now after this, it be every day nourished and fed cautiously and prudently with the arcanum of human blood, and kept for forty weeks in the perpetual and equal heat of horse dung, it becomes thenceforth a true and living infant, having all the members of a child that is born from a woman, but much smaller. This we call a homunculus, and it should be afterwards educated with the greatest care and zeal, until it grows up and begins to display intelligence. Now this is one of the greatest secrets which God has revealed to mortal and fallible man. <laughs> Remarkable. But despite being way out there, the creation of life from matter was not controversial at the time. It was widely believed that life could spontaneously appear, as evidenced for instance by the appearance of worms and insects in mud and in dying organisms. So it wasn't completely out of the ordinary for Renaissance man. And thus unfolded the mysterious history of alchemy. In the next lecture we'll discuss why alchemy remained popular even in the 17th century, the age of science. In fact, even Isaac Newton and Robert Boyle were enthusiastic alchemists. And we'll answer the important question how they could have fallen for such an obvious scam. And we'll describe how Europe eventually transferred from alchemy to the more, to the more rational chemistry. But for now, I hope you are inspired by this story. And if you want to know more about the history of alchemy or any other topic from world history, then read my book, In Search of the Sublime. You can read it completely for free on worldhistorybook.com or you can buy a physical copy on Amazon. Thanks so much for watching. Bye bye.